sense of native speaker norms That's a question for temporologists Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for temporologists If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? Feedback to learner autonomy We'll discuss it all on Teflology. Hi, Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Teflology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self certified Teflologists. Tefl News. So, uh, Tefl News, we're, we're back. That's the news. <laughs> The end yep, of that segment. Yep, no. yep. Um, so we're we're back after our little break. Um, we're we're hiatus, refreshed. Hiatus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Have you have you had any um, listeners that you know of asking when we'd be back? There's uh, been a few. Yeah, I've, I've had a few. I've had it's a couple. Been a few. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Who listens to us? I've got no idea. <laughs> people. Okay. Yeah. Good. I think there was a couple of people that feared that we'd never be back. That mm. this would be a kind of a. Um, one direction type <laughs> <From education. laughs> yeah. yeah yeah do you think that they were outweighed by the people who hoped we'd never be back <laughs> probably yeah yeah mm-hmm. but we're back you know we've all been doing our own little things um yeah yeah so well maybe for the 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 first part of today's news segment um do, do you have any personal news any tefl news any tefl stuff that's happened to you over the past three months any huge changes in your tefl lives um i mean for me i've 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 been doing my PhD now for about the past year, so that's been I've been working on that a bit more, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been focusing on that over the past two months. Yeah, yeah. So, so you visited yeah. the ELT archive, I believe. Yeah, the ELT archive that we often borrow, steal from uh, on this show. <laughs> yes. Um, not related to my PhD at all, but yeah, I visited there and I met Richard Smith, one of our former uh, interviewees. Yeah, and, and Steve Mann, another former. Steve Mann was there too, and, and Emma, Emma Shiordi. Yeah, they're all there. They're all there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're just to meet you. <laughs> it's a great yeah, honor. Kind of, but yeah, but yeah. So that, I mean, that's the biggest news for me. But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. nice. How about you, Matt? Uh, well, I'm I'm just just as we sort of speak. I'm in the last days of um, my current job position. Mm-hmm. Um, as maybe some of our listeners know, um, a lot of university positions, non tenure positions, are contract, so mm-hmm. sort of have a, a limited time. Uh, so I'm just finishing up at my current institution, and I guess preparing for my next one. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, it's, you know, maybe, again, as a lot of our listeners know, the Japanese academic year uh, finishes end of March. So just a lot of sort of end of year stuff, Mm. you know, the usual end of year stuff. Nice. Um, I guess, yeah, submitting proposals for conferences, that sort of thing, uh, publications, that sort of thing. Okay. Also, since we've been away, we've we've been on a podcast. We've been on a mm. Tim Tim Hampson's uh, uh, WTF. WTF, yeah. Yep. So there's that, and there's there should be another. Before we release this, there should be another episode with me on um, the English Riot podcast, mm-hmm. which is made by a guy called Damien in Thailand. And mm. yeah, so that that should be out soon as well, or it's already been out, I think. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yeah. The, the podcast cross pollination. Yeah, it's, it's taking shape. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Rob? What's new for you? Uh, well, I guess the biggest news is um, that in January, uh, the book that I've uh, co-authored with Marek Kichkoviak, who's also been on our podcast, yeah, yeah. Uh, was released. Um, it's called Teaching English as a Lingua Franca, the journey from EFL to ELF. Uh, and it's out with Delta Publishing right. in the UK, uh, the Delta Teacher Development Series. So that was quite exciting. Um, we're looking forward to getting the reviews in. Well, slightly looking forward to it. Um, and apart from that, just uh, yeah, continuing with writing submitting proposals i've submitted something to the uh, the british association of applied linguistics conference in mm-hmm. the uk mm-hmm. um and yeah waiting to hear back about all of those things so that's about it okay great okay yeah um so now that we've uh, got <laughs> our own personal news out of the way um there's one topic that uh, came up recently mm-hmm. on twitter and we've already mentioned the person who brought it to uh, Twitter's attention, which okay. is Tim Hampson. Oh, right, okay. Of the WTF ELT podcast? Yeah, or well, the other way around. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this was uh, a, a tweet that, that Tim made um, about the lineup of the uh, Korea Kotisol um, mm. conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was highlighting the speaker lineup, yeah. which yeah. was uh, just a, a selection of white men. 
basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, to begin with, uh, what, what what do you think about that just from the, well, that so brief I, description? So I, I came across like a, an ad, ad advertisement with with that, with I think one of them is Jack Richards. I'm not sure who else is on the ad on the uh, panel the lineup mm. and i remember thinking to myself that's not really going with the times like i remember thinking before any of this kind of blew up on twitter um yeah i remember thinking that looks a bit out of place I think. yeah um, so it, well in the tweet um the speakers that were confirmed were uh, rod ellis um andrew cohen thomas farrell Curtis Kelly, Peter Roger, and Bodo Winter, and um, we're not we're not attacking any of these people. All yeah. fine scholars, uh, yeah. the ones that we know, and you know the rest that we assume, uh, perfectly fine scholars. Um, but there was some criticism on Twitter that this was not a spectacularly diverse lineup, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and there has been within the LT a kind of movement to get more female and more sort of ethnic minority speakers, and just to try to balance things out a little bit. So. There have been organisations, um, TEFL Equity Advocates, Marek mm-hmm. Kitschkoviak's organisation, has uh, done a little bit of work on this, but I think the main one is um, EVE, yep. right? Equal Voices in ELT, mm-hmm. is that the correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, um, so they've been pushing for equal representation, and there have actually been lists produced as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so the uh, the FAIR list um, is a list of uh, speakers who can, uh, female speakers uh, who are available for conferences. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it does seem like uh, a shame that this conference in particular has chosen to uh, have just this kind of lineup. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now, to be fair, some of the um, some of the organisers did claim on Twitter that they're waiting to hear back from uh, female guests that they've invited, and that they did invite other people who haven't shown up. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then, it's you know, it's it's mm. uh, it, it's still slightly troubling that this is the way the lineup has kind of panned out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and like you've said it's it's kind of surprising in this in in this day and age in the um, year of our lord 2019 <laughs> yeah I, it, it seems like it is there's been a lot of awareness raising about this issue and it's surprising that you know cote is also a pretty big conference mm. um and it's kind of surprising that they would end up with this sort of lineup so yeah so why did they end up with this lineup um there was i think there was some justification so what they've said, uh, this is a tweet from the Korea Tessel official account. Um, we always do our best to promote diversity throughout all of our conferences, especially the IC, which I guess is the international conference. Um, for 2019, we invited several great female speakers to give talks, but they are all sadly unable to accept at this time. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, so that was that was their response. Um, yeah. Anyway, they, they did um, say in some other tweets that they've been trying to uh, diversify their panels, but... You know, just on this occasion, it's how it's happened to play out. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm I'm kind of in a similar position because I'm kind of involved with a forum, a, a conference here in Japan, and all of our participants are, are male. Mm. And um, I I talked to one of the that and that wasn't by design. That was that was in this case literally who who volunteered to be a part of it. But mm. um, we're thinking of ways to make that a part of the forum itself, make that a topic of the forum. Right. How can we kind of, you know, how can we make sure this doesn't happen in future and kind of make it a ref- more of a reflective topic of the forum? Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess part of it is is at the organization stage, whether or not they just make a list um, and, and, you know, make sure they include women, for example, but, you know, just contact these people and then see who replies. So mm-hmm. I, th- I think th- those are two different approaches to it. Yeah, and if you, I think the the first one, you probably have a better shot at creating a more diverse lineup. Mm. But you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm not sure what, you know which is the better way to go. Well, I guess one perspective on it would be that um, this isn't just a matter of choice. That there are there are like lots of implicit biases and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, and if we recognise that we have implicit biases to to pick you know certain people then it's incumbent on us to try and create structures to, to get around those biases. Like, we're not consciously necessarily picking mm. people um, based on their, you know, their, their, their white maleness, but if we end up yeah. doing that all the time, then we probably should try to consciously put in systems in place to, to not do that. Mm-hmm. And, and we know that this is a problem, right? Because we're, we're sitting here as, as three guys um, who, who started our own podcast, and we got criticism quite early on for not having uh, diversity in our guests. And so we've been trying, actively trying, to get as many uh, female and um, ethnic minority speakers 
uh, on the podcast as possible. And I but think we're fairly even, aren't we? I mean, I, I we not... still think we're quite white male heavy at the moment. Mm. I, not, mm. we're not that far off being even, but we're we're still leaning in that direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, maybe my point is um, Koti Sol's excuse that you know we have contacted a few women, we're waiting to hear back from them. Mm. But you know, for now, this is the lineup we have. Yeah. Um, that yeah, I'm not sure. It, yeah, it, it seems like they if if they were a little bit more dedicated to having a, a diversity of of invited speakers, it's not impossible to achieve that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I um, don't. I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a cop out. I don't think they did enough necessarily. Mm-hmm. Do right. you not think? I think yeah, yeah. They contacted everyone. Everyone was unavailable. They, mm. I think they should have dug maybe dug a bit deeper and. Mm-hmm. Tried a bit harder, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe, like, if, if it really is the situation that you've done your absolute best, but somehow you've still ended up with this lineup, maybe don't advertise that lineup until you've managed <laughs> to balance things out a little bit, mm. at least. Um, what do you think about these speakers that have been invited? Do you think they should have a, a say in. Like, if you were one of a panel of white, five white speakers, mm. would you say, no, I don't want to be on this panel? Uh, I think actually, so some speakers have been signing on to things to say, yeah, yeah. I will not appear um, on any panel that's all men, mm-hmm. for example. Yeah, They're called a, manals, by the way. There's been, a, <laughs> there's been a separate kind of thing going on on Twitter about that, about somebody being asked to kind of resign their position on a, a conference or something, mm. not naming mm-hmm. any names, mm. but... Yeah. yeah, I think, but I think that that per, I think I know who you're talking about. They did actually follow through, didn't they? And I, I think I believe so. so yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good thing too. It's an honourable thing to do, especially mm. if you're in a, a privileged position. Mm. Then you know you have the resources that you can give up to someone who doesn't have those resources, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's a, a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, and you know it, it is difficult. I I don't know if like if I was in that position, I I think I'd do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know you you. Like if if you're a very big internationally well known person mm. and you're going to loads of conferences, you probably haven't checked the lineups of everything that you're going to. So maybe you could end up in this kind of situation mm-hmm. and not realize mm. um, until someone mm. points it out to you. But then the same the same time, maybe it is sort of incumbent on you to check. I don't think it's that hard to check. Is it? Yeah, yeah, mm. Mm. yeah. So well, um, maybe hopefully this this little uh, firestorm will will help other. Um, conferences to to avoid this issue in the future Mm -hmm. Um, but for now that is uh, this episode's TEFL news TEFL pioneers okay so today I'd like to reflect on Bathusa Makin have you heard of her? no no. Uh, so her first name is spelled Bath Mm B-A-T-H-S-U-A I believe that's Bathusa Bathusa Bathsheba, Bathsheba, Bathsheba. Yeah. Well, where's she from? That might help. She's us. from from England. She's okay. From, from London. Right. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, hmm. Make making M A M A K I N. Mm-hmm. There was a G that's kind of disappeared over the years. Right. So I guess it's make making as mm. a as a surname. Uh-huh. But yeah. So I'm going to talk about her today. Um, now, of course, yeah, not a great deal is known about her. In fact, um, there have been some attempts over like more recent decades, perhaps maybe from the 1980s to try and kind of identify her a little bit more. But there's only been like two or three articles written about her. Mm -hmm. So she's very obscure, I Mm -hmm. guess, in that sense. Um, Just to give a bit of background, she was uh, active in the 17th century. Um, What do you know about the 17th century? What what, what, what comes to mind? The first thing that came to mind was big old wooden boats. (laughs) Okay, yeah, yeah. The the Enlightenment, the yeah, I think age. that yes, yeah, that mm-hmm. was that yeah. was mentioned. Yeah, the, the Age of Discovery was yeah. that then? <laughs> Francis Drake, yeah, Francis Bacon, Shakespeare. Francis Bacon was mentioned. Yeah, that came. What's up. the that difference was between uh, what's the difference between Francis Drake and Francis Bacon? Quick, go. Is that, is that a joke? No, it's a question. Oh, right. I don't know. Don't know. Drake, uh, Drake went to the west coast of America. I okay. Someone bought bacon cig- inve- one they- invented potatoes, the other one invented bacon. <laughs> Someone bought cigarettes back. Ironically, it was. Who brought, uh, who brought tobacco? And- uh, dr- uh, that was Rally. That was for Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, whole other. Did he do the potatoes that as well? Was, and the bacon. Was- These three are all the same. They're all the same person. Anyway, um, in terms of language in the 17th century, um, uh-huh. so competence in foreign languages among women, such as Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, was as you'd expect very 
much dependent on their social class. Mm-hmm. So a lot of royal, like, um, women that came from, like, royal families or the upper class obviously learnt languages. Um, some of them learnt uh, fashionable languages, like mm. French and Italian were very <coughs> fashionable at mm-hmm. the time. I'm not sure if they were practical. Do you think they had any practical value? Um, I would imagine Italian would have done for the, uh, as you were saying, the Enlightenment kind of stuff. Right. And I guess the, I, I don't know, I was... I don't know if it's the right time period, but I, I yeah. sort of recall hearing the so the royalty, the upper classes would speak French. That was a bit earlier on, I think. Yeah, that was after on. the French conquest, right? The Norman conquest. All mm. oh, right, oh, that far back. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was when the Normans conquested. Yeah, it. yeah. But like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I mean, it's probably still. I think. Yeah. yeah. It was still uh, maybe a high prestige language, but like Chinese in Japan, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. not a history yeah. podcast. <laughs> no, no. But for most, however, I think literacy in in the first language was was a concern. Sure, I think a sure. lot of people didn't know how yeah. to read and write in English, for mm-hmm. example. Mm. Um, so at this time, a school mistress, uh, ba- well, let me say Bathusa, call her uh-huh. Bathusa okay. Macon, and she was described as the most learned woman in England at the time. Wow. Um, it's a very lofty title, and is largely credited with reviving language learning among her female contemporaries. Mm. in the country so going to talk a little bit about her life today and her, her contributions um so she was born in 1600 they're pretty sure of that they found documented evidence that says that's when she was born in that year mm-hmm. and she died around 1675 in london mm-hmm. and again they know she died in london but not the year yeah. right but uh, um she was the oldest daughter of someone called henry reginald do you, do you know that name no, I don't okay. know. What's the difference between him and Walter Rock? <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was a schoolmaster as well of a well to do institution in London. Mm. Um, she also studied there, and she was described by a fellow pupil as having an exact knowledge in Greek, Latin, and French tongues, mm. with also some insight in Hebrew and Syriac. Yeah. Wow. So it was also said that much more learning. Okay, so this is a quote from the pupil. Um, much more learning she had doubtless than her father, who was a mere pretender to it. Why are they talking like Yoda? Yeah. <laughs> That's how they spoke. Then. And what did yeah. she have against the father? <laughs> well, this this people, I, well, I think he's claiming that she's better than her father. No, but she, then, but then also threw in a little insult on the father. <laughs> well, he's the he's the school headmaster. So okay, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Fair enough. So this same student suggests that the fame of her abilities kept scholars at his institution that would have otherwise left. Hmm. So at the time, even as a student, she had a lot of um, uh, influence over the other students right. at the time as well. So Henry Reginald himself, so just a little bit about him. So he wrote a manuscript on something called Macrolexis, um, which is described as a secret method of code of communication at a distance. Hmm. So I think this is kind of a way of shorthand writing. I guess mm-hmm. distance in that sense, like shorthand. Perhaps. Right. Not quite sure about that. Um, Bathusa herself married at the age of 22 to a servant of King James. Okay. And according to first-hand letters dated 1668, she survived the Great Plague of London and was thought to have died 10 years later. She got, Good. She got hit by a car. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have cars. Uh, in her 70s. Well, so she lived quite a long life for the time. Yep. Mm. 70s is pretty, pretty big. So her contributions... Um, so she worked mostly as a teacher, um, and at the time, being a being a female tutor was very rare. It was was completely kind of unheard of at so the she, time. So she was she was a private tutor rather than like a school teacher. Well, she was both. She okay. was I think I think she was a tutor before, and then she opened up her own school, and mm. she became a school mistress eventually. I think there was less of a strict dividing line between being like a private tutor and a teacher because yeah, schools weren't yeah. quite they weren't established in the same way that they are now right, I don't right, think. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah 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 so for example between the years of 1639 and 1640 just one year one or two <laughs> years um she was a tutor to princess elizabeth daughter of charles the oh. first hmm. and at the age of nine apparently macon had helped the princess to read and write greek latin hebrew french and italian wow right Whatever happened to that princess? What did she go on to? <laughs> I think yeah. she, um, she, during, it was, I read this, during the civil wars at the time between the U- Britain and Holland, mm-hmm. she was like arrested and, and executed. Oh. 
That's that's it's not the one who became queen. No, no, okay. no, no, no. She was daughter of Henry the Eighth. Oh yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth the First was before this. This was Elizabethan. This, <laughs> was, this was even, this was way before this. Right. Not Charles not II. that way before, but like a hundred years before. It's Charles the Second, right? Charles the Second, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so apparently she taught uh, Princess Elizabeth all these languages, mm -hmm. and as a result of this, she was left a, a sizable pension, as as a kind of a thank you, a gesture. Of uh, forty pounds a year, which I wow. reckon is massive. Yeah, I don't know how. I don't know big. what that would be in today's money, but yeah. it's pretty big. Pretty enough big to thing. retire on, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but she didn't, mm -hmm. as we'll find out. Okay. Um, so her her most notable work was uh, titled "An Essay to Revive the Ancient Education of Gentle Woman." Mm -hmm. Um, first published in 1673, so this was towards the end of her life this was published. Um, so in summary, this was a pamphlet advocating for the education of females, particularly the pursuit of classical languages, as a way to access classical literature. Uh, a quote from her, The tongues ought to be studied, especially the Greek and Hebrew. These will, be, these will enable the better understanding of the scriptures. And she makes a claim that women in earlier centuries had excelled in languages and deserved to be regarded as role models. And she makes a distinction between those that were mere talkers and those who could use languages. Hmm. So she refers to Elizabeth I as being a skilled orator at the time. Hmm. But I think her legacy was kind of forgotten over the time, over maybe over the 100 or so years after her death. So she wanted to kind of revive knowledge of of her basically right um so at her school she had a school in tottenham matt you uh -huh. you like tottenham right? no you Not don't, at all. Do you? <laughs> that's the other one you like um so she had a school in tottenham and girls could spend half their time studying latin french greek hebrew italian and spanish as a way to re-establish women's eminence in language learning so that was half of the time I don't know what they were doing the other half of the time, but that was only half of the time. Um, she points out that her main aim is that women should be able to acquire the knowledge of things. And to reach this knowledge, women must learn dead languages. That's a direct quote from her. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I mean, it sounds very in line with like a humanist sort of philosophy, um, mm -hmm. like being becoming the, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, what's, what's the phrase? A renaissance yeah. person, right? Um, so learning languages see, is seen more as a like a virtue in itself rather than as yeah, a, as, yeah, as a yeah. practical tool. Yeah. I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it, I think also just she want she thought that languages opened up kind of ways to read more literature. Mm. I guess literature that, that was otherwise not translated maybe right, at right. the time perhaps. I think that was mm. it. Um, Another one of her aims is that she wanted to teach women the, the power of rhetoric um, that would assist them in conversation with their husbands and in carrying out domestic duties mm, right. as well. So I think... Sounds kind of uh, a, bit, a bit sort of proto-feminist. Yeah, she was. she was. That's what she was describing. You just read the Wikipedia. I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although it says that she, um, she wanted uh, intellectual equality but not political equality. Oh, okay. Because she said... Yeah. Um, by striving to get everything, you are denied. No, by stri by striving to get too much, you're denied everything. Right. right. Yeah, I Don't read that on the section. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now this is where we get to a bit of a crossover with our our pioneers, our Tefl pioneers, because she was um very much she adopted the teaching methods of John Amos Com Comenius. Do you mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. I think that was your section. Yeah. You did. What What so. do you remember about him? Uh, very little. Um, <laughs> almost nothing. We talked about in episode 31, if that, that helps. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Just go through my uh, mental... Well, he, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So he devised a textbook that is described as being like a simple encyclopedia of a variety of topics. It's like a topic-based textbook mm -hmm. designed for the instruction of beginners in Latin. Mm -hmm. And um, this was constructed over 100 sections, subdivided into... A thousand sentences, mm -hmm. and I thought this was quite interesting. It gives equal respect both of words and things, mm. so that's very, it's very clear, very clear yeah. like, isn't it? Words and things is the title of that book as well by um, is it? Ernst Gellner. Oh, right, okay, yeah, it's a very famous book. Okay, yeah, but I thought that was quite interesting. He's kind of balancing the, the topic, mm -hmm. the content, and the words to, yeah, to understand that. That seems very kind of so up to date, semantic and the syntactic, yeah, yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. I thought that was quite interesting, yeah, but. Yeah, he he's not credited with Clill, is he, or anything? No. 
Uh, uh, yeah. Is he in that book you've got? Just <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> And Macon herself, she had very clear designs for the gentlewoman, as she as she called them, mm-hmm. through this method. So Macon argued that ten Latin sentences may be learnt in one day, fifty in a week, the thousand in twenty six weeks, allowing one day in a week and one week in a month for repetition. Thus, nine months is spent by gentlewomen that spend but six hours in a day at their books. Mm. So she had very clear this you will learn this if mm. you do this amount of hours, this amount of repetition in a week. Yeah. What do you think about that? Mm. A bit behaviourist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, as I, another bit too. Another three months are to be spent learning the French version and both Latin and French should be acquired by a gentlewoman of nine or ten years old. Yeah, I, it, I mean, it, I think it's... Maybe she has lofty sort of ideas and goals attached to this. Yeah, yeah. As, as a method of, of learning... A language i'm not so sure mm. i don't know as a method of learning a language for what purpose mm. if, it, exactly. if, if you're learning it for yeah. um just reading literature then it might be quite a good method i don't know mm. if you're learning it for communicative competence then probably not but but it's, it sounds like the goal was to learn it for literature yeah yeah so yeah. maybe maybe it was maybe, effective yeah. she she acknowledges that she had a lot of opponents to her, her method even at the time people were quite critical of her methods and they claimed that she shunned grammar and swerved the rules of didactics. <laughs> but she agrees that for her focus on memorization only, this really helped. This only really helped children conjugate verbs, for example. So she said yeah. it was limited, but so I mean that's yeah. I wonder if it was even effective for re- for yeah. developing reading skills. Yeah, yeah, maybe mm, not. Maybe, maybe just maybe learning not. grammar rules. Yeah. Right, right. And I don't. I, I mean. It's quite interesting when she says like the Princess Elizabeth could read and write French, Greek, Hebrew, Italian. I don't know what what mark Ma- what marker of proficiency yeah. did they have at that mm. time. It might like, have meant like they you know they put sentence you know forty seven in front of her. Yeah, and she, can recite she could the, she could say it. Yeah, the different yeah. versions of that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. And also like being the princess, she might have been like exposed to these languages. A lot well, yeah, more, apparently like, she was fashionable languages. Well, she was know. conversing with like overseas royal families at the time. Right. So um, I guess that in that sense, but I mean, I don't know how proficient they really were. Yeah. That's quite interesting to think about. Like, mm. There's no marker or measurement, I guess at the time. So, mm. but yeah, um, she believed in something called sync- synchrosis. Do you know what this is? Synchrosis. So this is comparing one thing with another that anyone teaching new ideas must compare them with something that's already familiar. Analogy. Yeah. yeah. Is it, is it? Okay. <laughs> so for example, um, rational instruction in Latin must be in a language that girls know already so that by synchrosis they will proceed from the known to the unknown. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that you know some some uh, SLA people have have said similar things that you you've basically got one pattern one linguistic pattern laid down by your first language and your second yeah. language is kind of built on top of that on those pathways that are already established yeah. to some yeah. extent. Yeah. Mm. Um, but you know, but this was the mm. same. I don't, as, I don't know if that's the majority view or not. This was mm. the same as a uh, Cormenius, mm-hmm. where he the teaching of Latin should be taught in the the local language. Mm-hmm. So kind of using using an L one, I mm-hmm. guess, to teach, like you know, yeah. So that's fairly up to date too, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I think it's a, it's a very modern thing, the idea of getting rid of the, uh, yeah, the L one, yeah. um, and I think that's it's quite questionable as well. Like, mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, when I say modern, I mean like I don't mean in the last ten years. I mean the last sort of hundred. Right. Years. Okay. Yeah. I see. Sure, yeah, compared yeah. to yeah, yeah. Her final, or I guess her the last contribution I'll talk about in a similar fashion to her father was her creation of a new form of shorthand known as radiography. Mm. Nothing to do with the medical, like the medical definition, yeah. uh, but it was called radiography, and this is said to be known as the first known example of the stave system. Mm-hmm. Do you know about that stave system, yeah. where individual sounds are denoted by short strokes, right, right. semicircles, or dots placed yeah. in relation to each mm-hmm. other. I've, yeah, um, I've seen it written. It looks a bit like, like orthography, like, Kengel, like Korea, like written oh, Korea. Okay. Yeah, the way that like, yeah, the way that mm. you depict words. Mm. I guess mm. so. This was one of the first known examples that she kind of created, and mm. yeah, so mm. that got lost over time, and 
rediscovered in in the eighties, apparently. Right. So, yeah. So yeah, I mean that's yeah today's uh, Tefl pioneer. So uh, that's a uh, Bathusa Makin. <laughs> In this episode's culture, uh, I'd like to talk about a topic. I'm kind of surprised we haven't discussed this yet. Uh, the closest we came seems to have been back in episode 12, oh. um, where, Matt, you talked about um, something called reacting to the past. Do you remember oh, that? yeah, yeah, I do, yes. And you mm. described it as a sub-method of ah. today's topic, which is CLIL. Ah, right, so you okay. called it a CLIL sub-method, okay. which, is, which is interesting in itself, um, the, the idea of sub-methods within CLIL, which we'll get to. Um, but so first of all, what does CLIL stand for? Content and language integrated together. <laughs> Learning. Oh, right? so, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That was nice. Um, so the, the, the term was, was coined, I think by David yeah. Marsh in 1994. Um, and it obviously has a lot of links to, um, immersion, CBI, that sort of thing. CBI um, stands for content. <laughs> Based together, Instru- <laughs> instruction. instruction, yeah, okay. Oh okay. I thought it was integration then. Oh. <laughs> instruction, yeah. Um, but I think the the idea of it from the beginning was uh, as an umbrella term to cover quite a few different um, approaches, methodologies. I'm not yep. sure. Um, so, well, maybe first of all, a definition. Again, there have been several definitions. I guess the most, the broadest, and the most, I guess, the, the one that kind of covers everything. Mm. Um, this one comes from uh, Coyle, Hood, and Marsh from 2010. Okay. So uh, basically, a, du- a dual focused educational approach in which an additional language is used for the learning and teaching of both content and language. Uh, each is interwoven, even if the emphasis is greater on one or the other at a given time. Mm. Um, have either of you had experience teaching CLIL, or, or maybe more accurately, would you describe yourselves as CLIL teachers? Partially. Okay. Um, so I teach some classes on, well, I teach a class on British culture, which mm-hmm. I'm not an expert on. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of the students are not students from the English department. So um, it's kind of a CLIL class because it's content focused, but it has to be graded to a certain level. I've never really thought of it as a CLIL ca- class yep. as such, but I guess it is. Mm-hmm. Um, apart from that, I teach some content classes in English, but they're not language focused at all. They're just content classes in English. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that counts as CLIL. Mm. Yeah, I think I've yeah I've certainly taught content. I've taught tourism, mm-hmm. um, but I guess the point that I'm at that I struggle with is where I don't have a strong footing in tourism. I can't. I'm at the assessment kind of because I think yeah. CLIL has an assessment. You have to assess yeah. the content that's produced, and mm-hmm. I'm not confident that I can assess the content. Mm-hmm. So I'm still on the language side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So yeah, that's kind of where I am at the moment, I guess. Yeah. So I, I've, I've come across a lot of um, different definitions of CLIL, but I think maybe kind of conceiving it or thinking of it as an umbrella ter- term is in some ways more useful um, because I've seen sort of taxonomies of, of CLIL mm. and it, it does describe a, a huge spectrum. And as you can maybe imagine, a lot of these spectrums are described in terms of, you know, sort of more weight on the content at one end, more weight on the language at the other end. Yep. Yep. Um, but we'll talk a little bit maybe later about why that may also be problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, but so maybe at the, at the uh, language end, um, the, the definitions I've heard of this, at, at the sort of the, the language end of the spectrum in terms of CLIL, is basically it, like um, one definition is just content heavy language classes. Mm. Um, so a language class that features some content. Right. Um, the, the sort of next one on might be theme, theme based. Um, uh, CLIL courses, so we're, we're at what people often call the soft CLIL end mm. of things. Is there any distinction between that mm. and ESP? Um, perhaps, maybe not. And I think, to be honest, I, I, I don't see much difference between that and just, you know, the most standard communicative um, EFL classes. To right. be honest. Okay. I think if you, you could pick up any textbook, and, and I've seen CLIL definitions where they say, you know, just, just your standard interchange headway book, it's it's theme-based by lesson. Right. And that's enough to sort of put it under the yeah. CLIL. Yeah. So yeah. an ESP would be even more CLIL than that. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Do you, yeah. not, do you not think CLIL is the the instructor themselves, like what they bring, like the content knowledge that they bring? 
Not necessarily. It, well, that's a whole other thing as well, isn't it? Does the yeah. language? I think that's something in Japan, particularly to Japan. Does the content come first, or does the language instruction or mm-hmm. knowledge of I think, language? I don't instruction, think that's just in or... Japan. I think that's like everywhere that they have. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're that probably discussion. struggling yeah. with that everywhere. Yeah. 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 So I wonder to what extent it's the instructor themselves that yeah makes it what it is. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Um, and so I get. And so moving on from you know, you could talk about each lesson has its own theme. You could then talk about sustained content. So the whole semester has has is just focusing on one topic, but maybe the it's still a bit more weighted on the language side of things mm. in terms of what the teacher is putting emphasis on in the classroom. And then at the at the other end, at the hard clill end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. then you'd be looking at things like total immersion, right? Um, where it's it's basically EMI, um, English as medium of uh, English medium instruction. Um, they, I think um, one of our um, uh, interviews, coming up interviews with Donna Brinton. Oh, yep. Um, she talks about, well, she talks. She actually talks about CBI, um, and her distinction between the two is more geographical than anything else. She talks about mm. CBI as being basically what came out of North America mm. and CLIL being, being what came out of Europe. Right. But otherwise, very similar. As kind of yeah. like audio lingualism and situational language teaching, like basically... Yep. Very similar. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I guess yeah. maybe the North American uh, context um, is more ESL, which maybe has differences. Right. Right. Um, but she also talked about what what another thing that comes under the Cole umbrella, which is adjunct instruction, where you might have a language teacher and a content teacher, right? Kind of, okay. Um, coordinating or collaborating on their classes. Even, I think yeah. yeah. Sheltered too. That came up. Right. Mm, yeah. 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 So that will be coming out soon. So. <laughs> yep. Little preview. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In uh, w- when we talk about CLIL, um, what do you think is meant by content? Topics. Okay. <laughs> well, I assume it's it's like specific subjects, like either it depends on the type of CLIL, I guess. Mm. But if yeah. it's like a, you know, um, an immersion type of CLIL, then probably academic subjects. If it's like um, more of a content based mm-hmm. instruction, like a soft CLIL, mm-hmm. then it might be like you know more sort of generalized topics like everyday topics mm-hmm. but it, it would be something that's not language specific yeah yeah, yeah. E- expertise again it comes back to the instructor expertise perhaps mm. like yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. the um, main specific yeah. knowledge okay yeah. <laughs> yeah um do you think language could be content well it can be but then yeah. it's not the kind of language teaching that we talk about it would be more mm-hmm. like your, your classic, or, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, philology. Like, I mean, I, I went to a presentation by a CLIL like, um, expert, mm-hmm. and they kind of said, I don't know what you language teachers are doing, because, like, you know, if you're not teaching with content, what are you doing? You're, you're teaching language detached from any kind of content. So, that's, yeah. not, that's not true. So I think they have a misunderstanding of language teachers, I think CLIL, CLIL professionals or CLIL mm-hmm. experts even, mm-hmm. they have an outdated view of what language teaching is. And I think language teaching is actually caught up mm-hmm. and the the um, the boundaries are uh, kind of less defined now. Yeah, but yeah. They're, they're not really aware of that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the feeling I get. You've like, probably got some CLIL teachers who came out of content teaching and some CLIL teachers who came out of language teaching. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And they probably have slightly different perspectives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. would be my guess. Yeah. yeah. But I think what, what CLIL teachers think we're we're doing if we if we are language teachers Mm -hmm. they think we're just teaching like isolated phrases or right so in other words a non-communicative approach yeah yeah that's not true there is there's always a a situation yeah there's always content so yeah so i mean in that case is it could can we consider it distinct from any other kind of communicative language teaching like yeah yeah anytime you're well, it, like you, you were saying just now that a soft clill can be equated to things like headway, interchange, yep. whatever. Yep. So in that case, obviously not. Uh-huh. Um, but if you're talking about content where, where it's teaching specific content, probably mm-hmm. spread out over a, mm-hmm. a long period of time, mm-hmm. possibly with a particular end goal in mind, mm-hmm. then I would imagine that that is more mm-hmm. uh, what we... Well, that's what I think of as, as clill. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I, I recently came across sort of two... Um, Different, but but definitely overlapping kind of frameworks to in, in terms of ways of thinking about CLIL. Um, so one, I, I I think it's accredited to Dale and Tanner. I mean, I'm not 100% sure. But they talk about the four C's of CLIL. Mm. Mm. 
Um, so they talk about content, which is maybe obvious. And the other, the next C is communication, um, which I think basically refers to the language as a sort of delivery a device for that content. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they also want to include cognition in it and uh, sort of de helping students develop cognitive skills. Um, and they, they consider um, culture as the fourth C of CLIL. Mm. Um, and in terms of that, they talk about understanding ourselves within our cultures and being a global citizen. Mm. So I've got two questions. Yep. You said um, the second C, communication, the language as a vehicle mm. for the content. Mm. Um, does, that, does that refer only to the instruction of the content or also the... Um, the the learning so uh, the, yeah, the, 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 yeah. the the learner's role as well as the teacher's role yeah that's my first question my right. second question is about culture yeah um what does that mean what does it mean that seems it just seems yeah. very vague the definition of culture given there yeah um there's obviously like very contested views about what culture is mm -hmm. um especially within language teaching and global citizenship stuff as mm -hmm. we've discussed with previous interviews uh, mm. yeah. so how how are they specifically working that out and how does that integrate with the other C's. Mm. Well, I think I think the first C is how how the learners articulate the knowledge that they're getting, like right. how they articulate the content back. Mm -hmm. I guess in an, in an assessment um, So you're saying the teacher, not the teacher, but just the learners. Yeah, uh, yeah, I I read that more on the learner side, like the learners okay. are getting the content, but they need to articulate it back. You know, they need to they need to deliver it by using appropriate language mm. and content, they need to use communication to do that. That's how I get it. But yeah. mm. I, I'd imagine it's both ways. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So like the you know what comes from the teacher, what the learners use. It, it's just basically the the medium of instruction. Yeah, it's two way. Right. It's two mm -hmm. way. It's a dialogue. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, in in terms of culture, I think I mean I think it's partly they're looking for a word that begins with C. Right. Um, <laughs> and it sort of fits in. Um, but I think it's, I mean, when I sort of read a little bit more about it, it's, it seemed like it's, it's, I don't know, it, I think a lot of CLIL teachers maybe, may, maybe would do some of these things, but not necessarily considered an, an integral part of what they think of, it, of as a CLIL approach. Mm -hmm. um, it seems something sort of extra on top, but, but for these, you know, CLIL practitioners, it's something important. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's, it, what they're basically talking about is, yeah, developing global citizenship, however you want to interpret that. Okay. Um, and, and sort of recognizing your, 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 yourself as a member of society, as a member of... So that's, that's very yeah. interesting. So if um, you were, say, in a, in a country with a, you know, a very strong, uh, let's say, nationalist government mm. that was using English uh, mainly you know, as, um, as a tool for you know, I don't know, getting knowledge from other countries, not necessarily for communication, mm. and you were doing everything else, that wouldn't count as CLIL because it doesn't have that fourth C of culture? Perhaps not for, for, for those un people. under this framework, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the other sort of framework I, that I've looked at is um, they talk about three dimensions of CLIL. Um, this is from a, a relatively recent book, 2015, uh, Ball, Kelly, and Clegg. Mm. Um, so their three dimensions are concepts, um, which is more, more or less um, referring again to the content, uh, language, um, and then procedure. And that kind of links to the cognition of the, the, the uh, okay. previously. Mm -hmm. So the cognitive skills involved. Yeah, yeah. So when they're describing a clear lesson, they, they talk about in terms of the, the content, the language used for that content, and then also the sort of cognitive procedural things, like our students interpreting ideas, or are they just transcribing ideas, etc. And I've mm. heard this described as, a, as like a mixing desk, Yep, like yep, at, at so. certain points in the course or in mm -hmm. the lesson, yep. you turn up the content. Yep. At other times, you emphasize the language yep. related yep. to that content, and so. then at other times, it's all about production. Yep. So all, all three are yeah. always there, but yeah, yeah. that's, that's yeah. the metaphor yeah. they use. That's a nice sense. metaphor. I like. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that quite yep. helpful to, to think in that way. Because yes, like, I've I've certainly taught a lesson where it's been very content heavy about like tourism related stuff, mm -hmm. and then later in the lesson, I give them some like discussion skill phrases to articulate those ideas mm -hmm. yeah so i i can kind of see that in my head how yeah, that yeah. would apply but yeah. yeah yeah um what both frameworks sort of have in common is they both talk about the idea of guiding input and supporting output mm. um, so i okay. guess maybe the input it, it's hard it's maybe odd to say that input and output is more important when when content has such a 
is more heavily featured because you, you would assume that input and output is an important part of any language lesson. Mm. Um, but maybe that has the input and the output has a nice, it's a nice way to think about how the language and the content are actually integrated. Right. right. And so I think it's the second C. Well, the, 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 the two C's sort oh, of together. Okay, so I think what, what actually what, what Bol, Kelly and Clegg, um, they, they disagree with, uh, Marsh's definition of this idea of dual focused, um, because they focus a little, little bit more on the integration. Mm. So not necessarily looking at it as kind of two parallel strands, but as, I guess, two intertwined strands or, or two yeah. really integrated yeah. things. Right. Um, and so I think that comes down to, well, actually that, that'll maybe come up a little bit more in the next thing I want to talk about, which is coming back to this idea of assessment. Um, what most, I guess the, the big question that a lot of people have about CLIL is, um, if you're a content specialist, how do you assess the language uh, and vice versa? Mm. Um, do you, well, in, in your courses that you, that you put more of emphasis on the content, how, how do you, do you assess the content directly? Where I put more emphasis on the content. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like that, that is what I assess. I assess okay. the content and not the language. Like that, what, what do you mean by assessing the content though? Um, so I give them, um, so, you know, in the British culture class, mm -hmm. um, we learn about different aspects of, you know, different cultural things mm -hmm. um, and they do research at home and then they have to write an essay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I assess the essay based on the accuracy and the, uh, not the accuracy of the language, the accuracy of the content. Okay. Like, did, they, did they get the facts for it? All right. It? Yep. Um, and also how, uh, like, did they introduce any material from outside of class from their own research? Mm -hmm. Um you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. not focusing on the language at all. Yeah, the language yeah. is, there is a language focus in the class, but the language focus is just there to make the content attainable to them. Right. So I, I, it's interesting that you use the word just, though. Okay. Yeah. Why? Um, because, I mean, how, how else would they express their ideas about that or, or that information about the content? Well, the, the, I mean, yeah. what I'm saying is that the if the students were of a high enough level... Mm -hmm then I wouldn't have a language focus at all. Mm. The language focus is only there because the students mm -hmm. don't have the necessary level to grasp yeah, yeah. the material as it is. Yeah. Do you think there are cases of, con I mean, uh, of, you know, I don't know what you call it, content courses mm -hmm. um, for students who are not um, doing it in a second language mm. where there is, there, even in those cases, there's some consideration of language? Well, of course, jargon. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I would assume so. Or like, yeah. if you, when you're reading very uh, complex sort of philosophy and things yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. and you know, yeah. just yeah. reading it doesn't actually help you understand it. You have to sit and read and dissect and go through sentence sentence, all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Okay. But the goal then isn't for that language to pro to become productive outside of that context, right? So if you're learning jargon, you're learning jargon in order to discuss just those issues in the class. Whereas I assume if you're learning CLIL, one of the purposes is to learn language that you can then use in wider communicative situations. So is that, not okay. when, so is that in, your, in your classes, is that part of the goal of the language that you introduce? No, like I said, the language is there just to help them okay. learn the so, so it doesn't have that extra goal of... Um, it, it doesn't, but it's such low-level language that yeah. it could. It could, okay. Yeah. Is that not where that last culture comes in, going out into the wider... I guess so that's, it, that's it, culture, isn't it? Like you're taking your knowledge out into the world, and I guess it could be. Yeah, I wonder if that's that, it. it yeah. Again, it depends how they apply it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. My, I mean, I taught a, a, a tourism class about augmented reality. Mm. So the top, the content was augmented reality, and they had to make augmented reality posters in mm. English. Mm, so yeah. I've got my the way I assessed them here was informativeness. So the quality and depth of the posters information, mm -hmm. creativity, the level of creativity of the posters, um, enhancement, how the AR enhanced the posters. So how it was actually used mm. in like a real term, how useful the posters were for tourists mm -hmm. and the teamwork, how cohesive they were as a team. Mm. So they, they were my five assessment criteria. Mm -hmm. Um, none of that's really language based. That's mm. all heavily focused on the content and the the yeah. application itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so mm. yeah, yeah, that's why I did. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, it sounds like both of your uh, experiences are, I guess, like sort of in the middle of that clear spectrum. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, but when it comes to the assessment, maybe it, there's a, a stronger leaning on the content side of things. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I think yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've also got those courses that are just content, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't consider those CLIL at all. Mm-hmm. Apart, like The only reason I think someone could, could consider those CLIL is because the students speak English as their second language, Yeah, but it doesn't make any difference to how I teach or what I teach. Mm-hmm. But are, so, you, are you yeah. making any language decisions in the way you present ideas? Like, Are you saying, are you, I, are I, you grading I, the language? I grade something? the language down a little bit. But I, I, think, I think that's CLIL then, because you you're don't working you f- on the language. I don't know. Mm. Do you think that sociology teachers in sixth form grade the language differently to sociology yeah, professors? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Because then that isn't that clear. Right. Well, yeah, <laughs> right. that's but the then thing. again, yeah. Do, yeah. does it does it have to be for in, you know in somebody's second language, or or could it just have linguistic aspects that need to be considered? Again, but the, the, my so the the distinction I drew earlier, I think, mm-hmm. still stands, which mm-hmm. would be. Are you teaching the language as an object in itself, or are you teaching the language purely to understand mm-hmm. the content? If mm-hmm. you're teaching it like those, that four C model mm. would seem to indicate that the that the purpose of teaching the language is to help the students um, perform in a in a, a a wider outside role than just the class. Mm. Um, whereas if you're teaching them just in order to understand the content mm-hmm. itself, mm. then it seems like a different thing. I, I think there's a distinction mm. there. It's, it's probably yeah. a, maybe a distinction without a difference, but, mm. right, right. but there, there is a distinction there in yeah. terms of the yeah, focus. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So that was this episode's TEFL Culture, CLIL. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Okay, and yeah, we've been away for two months, but all the same... Um, channels of getting in contact with us are there i think you can email us teflology at gmail.com you can follow us on twitter at teflology you can listen to all of our previous episodes i'm sure you've been doing that over the last two months anyway but uh teflology hyphen podcast.com is the place to do that um youtube i mean we upload these podcasts on youtube so you can listen there or watch there i guess uh, if you wanted i wouldn't watch it it's just a static (laughs) image yeah and um, our book is still out there on Amazon. Um, it's out there somewhere. We don't know where. <laughs> it'd be great if you could. It's at large. Buy some copies for your family, your pets, your enemies. Friends, <laughs> just to put under a table. Right, you know, so just, just yeah. You so, mean under the table, the table leg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's too yeah. much space under this table. <laughs> yeah. Got to fill it with books. But, um, yeah, no, buy, buy that book and that will be supporting the podcast. So, yeah. Yeah. If you want to support us directly, then you can just mail us some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so for now, it's uh, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>